Welcome to the fourth video on John Walton's six-part Lost World series. Walton is an Old Testament scholar specializing in ancient Near Eastern backgrounds and culture. And he's also the main professor of exegesis at Wheaton College. Today, we will be covering the Lost World of the Israelite Conquest, Covenant, Retribution, and the Faith of the Canaanites. Walton is convinced that while the scriptures were written for us, they weren't written to us. And we have to learn how to reason with an Israelite ancient Near Eastern logic. The scriptures are authoritative and reveal God's plan and purposes for us, which are good, but that doesn't mean that they offer us a list of rules to follow, as many often assume. By asking, why is this passage here? We can analyze our assumptions about the text. Walton argues that to understand a conquest account accurately, we have to understand the difference between descriptive and prescriptive writing. In descriptive writing, something is simply being described. But in prescriptive writing, one is being told to do something. Walton is convinced that in its ancient Near Eastern context, the conquest account is descriptive in nature. Throughout later history, however, people have tried to find the conquest account prescriptive, and it has led to a divinely sanctioned violence. It's important to understand as well that the Levitical holy laws from which many cite in order to support condemnation of the Canaanites is in the form of legal wisdom. And the point of legal wisdom in the ancient Near East was not to give us a list of rules, but help us as a guide to understanding wisdom. It's sort of like a math problem in which the point is to understand the underlying theory, not necessarily all of the illustration's details. Walton also thinks it's vital that we understand the difference between progressive and procedural thinking. In progressive thinking about the Bible, people view God's revelation as an unbroken chain of events, stages in history, through which we progressively see God's eternal goal more and more clearly. Many people see the conquest account through this lens, and they can become confused as to why God would seem to sanction violence and other non-modern ideals. In contrast, procedural thinking is like baking a cake, in which the ingredients at every stage may look completely different than each other, but they're all necessary for the final goal. Similarly, we may not evaluate each stage of God's purposes by what we think his ideal is, just like we can't compare flour and milk to the final outcome of the baked cake and say that one or the other is not necessary just because they don't look like the final outcome at the moment. Walton suggests that we view the conquest account through a procedural lens, and that the point of the conquest account is to bring to fulfillment God's promise to the Israelites, which is to bring the new covenant, which is to bring a new creation. And we have to understand the conquest account as part of God's purposes, even if we don't see how it fits in at the moment. Walton then discusses the book of Job and John chapter 9. In these texts, he sees the concept of people suffering maybe without a cause, but not without purpose. This is highly relevant to his case because he will go on through careful exegesis of relevant texts to show how the Canaanites were not suffering because of their sin. Walton notices that certain Hebrew language structures that are used in other parts of the Old Testament are not found in the Canaanite narrative. Things like a formal indictment against the Canaanites, a narrative that is used to document their crimes, and the fact that their fear is of Yahweh's power and not of their sin guilt. The conquest proceeds in order to fulfill the promises of the covenant to the Israelite people and to sustain them under that covenant, not to punish a group of people for idolatry and other acts. Walton insists that idolatry is wrong in the context of covenant, and it's often linked to a marriage violation. In addition, Kings in the ancient Near East were the ones that made covenants, and the Old Testament language seems to indicate that Yahweh is the kingly ruler over his people, and idolatry is a breach of his kingly rule. Furthermore, he argues, the Hebrew words often translated detestable and bad are used as covenantal terms to describe behavior that's outside the bounds of covenant. Mentioned behaviors that the Canaanites engage in are only punishable offenses when Israelites do them. Much of Walton's book centers around the concept of harem, 
which is often translated as completely destroy and used in context of what the Israelites did to Canaanite communities. Walton, however, translates it as remove from use and given to Yahweh. Yahweh intends then to lease back the land to the Israelites on the basis of their covenant fidelity. Haram is on the cities, and so it's important that they're emptied, preferably by the fear of the Lord that Yahweh put on the people, but also by killing if necessary. Israel waged wars in similar ways to the ancients. They performed divine oracles to determine divine favor, they consecrated soldiers, they had a divine vanguard, and they employed Haram. It was different in that it wasn't on behalf of some kind of lawsuit or some kind of king's fulfilled desires that were selfish. Haram focuses on removing community identity, not on genetic cleansing. Women were actually allowed to stay alive because they didn't have inherent community identity in the ancient Near East like men did. The Canaanite identity is removed in order not to create a snare for the people of Israel to get caught in. Walton notices that God actually does allow certain Canaanite groups to stay within Israel in order to test them. Foreigners were allowed to stay in the land of Israel, but whether or not they were a part of the Israelite community identity, they still had to respect the covenantal laws. Now, you may be thinking, how in the world does this apply to my life in 2019? Well, Walton describes the Old Testament as a template for the new. The Old Testament is like a bilingual German to English dictionary, and the New Testament is like an Oxford English dictionary. The Old Testament helps us make sense of the new. Based off this observation, Walton makes a few applications that he sees Paul invoking. One, we are to haram our flesh or our evil deeds because these do not fit in the purposes of God for the world. Two, we are to haram the sub-identities of the world that exist in the church that do not conform to the church's identity of in Christ, whether Gentile, Jew, female, or male, slave or free, as Paul says. We are one in Christ out of many. Third, we, like Paul, must be willing to leave the privileges that may come with their other identities. And lastly, we are to harem individuals who compromise the church's identity, heretics, through removal from the community. God must be able to do his work in our lives. Now, many object that the conquest sounds completely unfair. There was already people in the land, and if they were innocent, as Walton suggests, it seems like the conquest is even less ethical than if they were guilty. Other scholars argue that Rahab and the Gibeonites are exceptions to Walton's view on Haram. Walton answers these objections in his book, so if you're curious, I would suggest you read it. There are an overflow of exegetical gems in this book that I simply could not include in the short review. Like the ancient Near Eastern invisible barbarian tactic the author of Deuteronomy utilizes to describe the Canaanites. It's a priceless insight. If you want to upgrade your understanding of the conquest accounts and talk more scholarly about this very misunderstood topic, I would highly recommend reading Walton's book. Even if you don't agree with everything he says, I promise you it will be formative in your quest for truth. But until then, be sure to continue on the journey with us in the next week's video on the lost world of scripture, ancient literary, culture, and biblical authority.